Hi everybody, welcome to chapter 25 and 26. So these two chapters are all about DNA, which is the genetic material, and um, how DNA works, how it uh, codes for the different proteins and genes in our body, and how we can control um, protein production. So prior to knowing that DNA is was the prior to knowing that DNA was the genetic material that was passed on from parent to offspring, a lot of individuals thought it was the protein that was important. There's a reason for that. Protein is large. We see protein. Protein makes up pretty much our entire body. And so, you know, the idea that protein is a really important um, organic molecule. Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase worked on different experiments to um, determine what was actually being passed from parent to offspring. And they came up with two different um, experiments, one using... Um, well, both using a virus called a bacteriophage. In one, the um, DNA within the bacteriophage had radioactive phosphorus. And so we use phosphorus as the backbone of our DNA molecule. Remember, um, we have a sugar phosphate backbone, and then we have the nucleotides in the middle. In the other experiment, they used radioactive sulfur, and sulfur is needed in protein production. And what they figured out, or what they found at the end of both of their experiments was that DNA was what was entering the cell. So let's look at how they figured this out. So here we have bacteria um, that are so these are bacteria, they're in this solution. So this is a culture of bacteria. Within the solution, they've also added these bacteriophages that are in um, the solution. And these bacteriophages contain radioactive phosphorus. So they allowed the bacteria and the viruses to sit together for a long period of time, you know, hours, maybe even a couple of days. And then they blended the material so that they were able to get the viruses um, to be or to remove from the bacteria. Once they did this, they then centrifuged the solution. Um, what this would do is it would allow the viruses and the liquid to be found, um, since it's lighter, it would be up here, and then the bacteria would be down here in this area called the sediment. Um, and so in this experiment, they were able to find radioactive material in the bacterial cells. Sorry. In the other experiment, so I don't have that picture, but I want to just explain it. They used the radioactive, radioactive sulfur, and that was around the um, it was a portion of the capsid for the bacteriophage. They did the same thing. The bacteria and the viruses were able to sit in the solution so that bacteriophages could infect the viruses. And once they sat for you know hours or maybe a couple of days, they then blended the solution to dislodge the, the bacteriophages, and then they centrifuged the solution. Um, again, the bacteria are found in the sediment at the bottom, and the viruses are found up in the liquid that's lighter. 
And this time, the viruses were what were um, radioactive, the virus and the liquid, not the bacteria. So we know that bacteria were taking in the DNA and were being um, changed, were able to, to um, be converted, have new characteristics or whatever it is, okay? So now we know that DNA is genetic material, and James Watson and Francis Crick are the two individuals that um, get the majority of the credit for determining the, the structure of DNA. There were a lot of people that helped in determining the structure of DNA, though. They already knew that DNA is composed of nucleotides. Um, and a nucleotide contained a sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. They knew that the four nucleotides were adenine and guanine, cytosine and thymine. They were able to put together that A and T always paired together and G and C always paired together. Um, this is known as Chargaff's rule. And what he did was he noticed that every time you had a certain amount, um, percent amount, of one nucleotide, there was always a similar amount of another nucleotide. And then the other two nucleotides had the same. So if you had 20% adenine in the entire um, DNA molecule, you also had 20% thymine, which means that the guanine and cytosine would make up the other 60%. And then Frank, um, Rosalind Franklin and um, her lab partner, um, Wilkins, were working on trying to identify the structure of DNA as well. And they used a process called X-ray diffraction. And this allowed them to identify that or to show that the DNA formed a helical structure. And the inside of the helix was where the nucleotides were. The outside was, was where the sugars and phosphates were. I should say the nitrogenous bases were. And then the outside was where the sugar and phosphates were. And so this is Rosalind Franklin. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, she doesn't get, um, or she did not receive the Nobel Prize with um, Watson and Crick and Wilkins. And the reason for this is because she died at a very young age of can from cancer. You can't give um, a dead person the Nobel Peace Prize. So she was never given this, but we like to honor her by explaining that she was very important in discovering the structure of DNA. So we now know that um, DNA is the genetic material. We know that adenines and guanines, or I'm sorry, um, we know that adenines and thymines always pair together, guanines and cytosines always pair together. We um, know that adenine and guanine are called purines, and thymine and cytosine are called pyrimidines. And we always pair a purine with a pyrimidine. And um, this is how, and I won't say that. And the purines and pyrimidines have to be able to fit together. So they have to be complementary. In 1962, then, they won the, P the Nobel Peace Prize. And so here are Watson and Crick um, identifying the structure of DNA. So let's look at the structure of DNA, then. This is a DNA strand. It is double-stranded. All DNA molecules are double-stranded. And they, are, they form a helix. So they're kind of wound up. 
Um, adenines and thymines always pair together. Cytosines and guanines always pair together. The outside is composed of sugars and phosphates. The sugar is called deoxyribose. And the, the phosphates are called phosphates. <laughs> DNA replication occurs anytime our cells want to divide. Um, you have to be able to produce new DNA um, so that the new cells that come from a parent cell will have the genetic information as well. It's termed semi-conservative because we pair up a parent strand of DNA, so it's a double-stranded molecule, we split the double strands and then we replicate both sides and each new replica newly replicated strand um, winds up with its parent strand or the complement. So before replication actually starts, the strands of DNA are going to be wound up and um, held together by hydrogen bonds. So the first thing that has to happen is we have to unwind and unzip our DNA. Basically, um, the, what this will do is it breaks the hydrogen bonds and it allows us to be able to produce new complementary strands of DNA. So here you have the DNA molecule. It's double-stranded. The blue strand is the parent, um, parent strands unwind, and the hydrogen bonds are broken, so it's unzipped, and we start producing new nucleotides on each side um, that are complementary. This allows us to produce two um, strands, two double-stranded DNA molecules that are identical to each other. So here's the parental DNA. Parental DNA is going to um, unwind and unzip. So you can see here is one of the parental strands, and here's the other parental strand. These strands here with the purple are the daughter strands. And anywhere that we have a C in the parental strand, a G forms, or a G nucleotide comes in. Anywhere we have a G, a T, or a C will come in. Anywhere we have a T, an A comes in, and anywhere we have an A, a T comes in. And so we end up having two identical double-stranded DNA molecules, and the parent strand and the daughter strand that was just produced wind up together. This is semi-conservative replication. RNA is similar in structure to DNA but it has very different functions. So DNA carries our genetic information, codes for all of the proteins that, are, that make us who we are. RNA is produced from DNA. It is single-stranded. It contains a sugar, phosphate, and nitrogenous containing base, but the sugar is ribose, and the nitrogenous bases um, are similar. We still have adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but in place of thymine, we use uracil. Um, RNA has three different types. We have a messenger RNA, transfer RNA, and a ribosomal RNA. So this is the structure of RNA. It's a single-stranded molecule. Um, still has a sugar phosphate backbone, but the sugar is ribose. And instead of thymine, we have uracil. Here's a comparison of DNA and RNA. So this one forms a helix. It's double-stranded. This one does not form a helix. It's single-stranded. Um, both have adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but DNA has thymine, RNA has uracil. DNA has deoxyribose, whereas RNA has ribose. So let's look a little closer at RNA because RNA is, is um, used in protein synthesis. So DNA carries the genetic information, 
And then RNA actually codes that information into a language that our cells use. And then um, we can produce a protein using the RNA. There are three types of RNA, messenger RNA, which carries the message of DNA in an RNA form that our cells can read. There's transfer RNA, which picks up amino acids and carries the anticodon. Um, the anticodon allows the transfer RNA to bind to the messenger RNA and the amino acid is going to be what is coded for in the messenger RNA. And then we have ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA is what makes up the ribosomes. And ribosomes are what produce proteins. So for gene expression to occur, there are two basic steps. We have transcription, and then we have translation. Trans Transcription um, occurs in the nucleus of our cells. D that's where DNA is located. DNA cannot leave our cells or cannot leave the nucleus. So <clears throat> transcription takes a makes a copy of a region of DNA that codes for a protein um, and makes a copy of the DNA in a messenger RNA form. So think about it like if you don't understand something, you know, maybe it's a language you don't understand. And so you have someone copy something into a language you do understand. So I always think of um, like a play when you're when you're going to produce a play. Sometimes the play comes in a language like Latin or um, German or Spanish, you know, something that you may not be able to read. And so you have it transcribed into English, which you can read. That's transcription. But in this case, the DNA is what our cells can't read but they can read RNA. And so we just transcribe it into a messenger RNA molecule. <clears throat> and then we use translation, which is taking the message of the DNA in that messenger RNA form and producing the proper amino acids um, sequence that can produce a protein. So here's our DNA strand. Um, for transcription to occur, DNA is going to unwind and unzip at a specific area, so at some gene that we care about. We use the template strand of DNA to produce a complement copy, and so that's what this says. <clears throat> and then we read the messenger RNA, <coughs> sorry, and three nucleotide sequences. So each three nucleotides codes for one amino acid. And so each of these is an amino acid. The amino acids then um, bind together, producing peptide bonds. And we're able to then allow the amino acids to fold up into a, um, the functional protein form. So during transcription, DNA is going to unwind and unzip at a specific region only. So the entire molecule doesn't, doesn't open up. Um, RNA polymerase will bind to a region called the promoter region on the DNA. And then RNA polymerase will allow new RNA nucleotides to bind complementary to the template strand of DNA. So here we have this DNA molecule. 
here's the promoter site, and over here is the terminator site, and in between is the information for the gene, for the, whatever protein we care about. RNA polymerase binds, um, allowing the unwinding and unzipping of the DNA. As soon as it binds, it starts moving along the DNA molecule. And as it moves, it allows nucleotides that are complementary to the um, template strand to um, bind. And this produces a message right here of the DNA in an RNA form. And so this is our template strand. What that means is that this strand up here actually codes for a protein. And if you look close, everywhere we have a C here, we have a C up here. Everywhere we have an A here coming in, we have an A. The one difference is anywhere that there's a T in DNA, we have a U in RNA. And so this is going to be identical to the coding strand of the DNA. So here again is a transcription. So this is the template strand. This is the coding strand. Here we have the um, messenger RNA that's produced using this template strand. It is going to be identical to this coding strand except anywhere we have T's in the DNA, we have U's in the RNA. And then I just made the um, proteins or the amino acid sequences colored. So you see there's one, two, three, four, five, and you can go on and see them all. So transcription occurs in the nucleus. And in eukaryotic organisms, transcription doesn't just end with the production of the messenger RNA because messenger RNA in a eukaryotic organism is initially considered immature or not functional. Um, our DNA codes for proteins, codes for all the proteins in our body, but the majority of our DNA does not actually code for proteins. Most of our DNA um, codes for things like promoter sequences or terminator sequences or other things. And so we have um, segments of DNA that don't code for a protein. Those segments are called introns. When I think of introns, I think of commercials in a TV, in a movie or a TV show that you're watching. They don't have anything to do with the movie, but they're there. And so we get rid of those introns, and then we just have these exons left over. That's the actual movie then in the TV show. Um, these are the segments of the of the DNA that code for our genes. So when we produce that messenger RNA, we have to um, take out all the introns and then splice together the exons. Once we've done that, we add a guanine cap and we add a polyadenine tail or a polyadenosine tail. Once we've done that, we now have mature messenger RNA that can move into the cytoplasm. So here we have. Um, the DNA. Here we have the messenger RNA. Um, we add a cap, guanine cap. We add a poly A tail. We get rid of these introns, oops, sorry, and splice together the exons, and we end up having a mature messenger RNA molecule that only codes for the protein. <clears throat> this mature messenger RNA can then leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm where it will then bind to a ribosome, either a free-floating ribosome or a ribosome that's found in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
and will produce the protein that um, the messenger RNA is coding for. And so for that, we use a genetic code. A genetic code is a code that helps us read our DNA or RNA. Um, for our genetic code, we use three nucleotides to um, code for one amino acid. And because we have four different nucleotides total, we can actually code, or we can actually produce 64 different codes or codons. 61 of those codons code for amino acids, and we only have 20 amino acids, so the code is redundant, but that's actually beneficial because it keeps us from uh, having mutations that cause um, lethal problems to organisms. And then we have three that are called stop codes, and these are what stop um, translation. So at that point, we know that the protein is now fi finished being produced. So here's the messenger RNA, um, or here's a messenger RNA codon table. In the first column, you see UCAG. This is what we're going to use to find our, or to help us identify the um, proper amino acid. So if our code is AUA, I'm just making it up, we would look at this and we'd say UCA, we know that our code is AUA, so we have to look somewhere in this area, okay? We then use the second letter, and that's going to be found across the top row. So again, we have UCAG, and we know it's AUA, so we know we're going to go into this column because it's under this row. So we're in this large row section, or this section of rows, and in this column. So we know it's one of these four is going to be our AUA. To find the actual amino acid, you can go to the, the final column where we have our third base. And so we already know that we're down here, so we're going to skip these first two large boxes and go here, UCAG. So AUA, it's this one, we're going to move over here and we see AUA is isoleucine. That's our first amino acid. When we're used, or when we are um, translating a protein, messenger RNA is what carries the um, information of the protein in the, um, from the DNA form in the RNA form, which our cells can use. Transfer RNA is a molecule that can pick up amino acids, proper amino acids, and bring them to the messenger RNA that's um, threaded into the ribosome. Um, it contains the anticodon, which will bind to the proper region of the messenger RNA and carry the amino acid that's associated with that section of messenger RNA. So CGG, if that's the codon in the messenger RNA, the Transfer RNA will contain a GCC anticodon that will bind to the CGG, and it will carry arginine, which is the amino acid. And so here, there's where your amino acid will sit, and that's more like what I would draw. And then down here is the anticodon, which is again, going to be right down here. Ribosomes are either going to be free-floating in the cytoplasm or attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. 
there are two subunits to a ribosome. Ribosomes have a large and a small subunit. Eukaryotic ribosomes um, are called ADS ribosomes, while prokaryotic ribosomes are called 70S ribosomes. And the ribosome comes together around a messenger RNA molecule and provides a site for transfer RNA molecules to come in. So this is what a ribosome looks like. Um, ribosomes have three different spots or binding sites. I usually only talk about two, so a site called the B site and the A site. Um, I don't really talk about the first site. Amino acids move in one at a time, or I should say transfer RNAs move in one at a time, and um, they bring along their amino acid, and as the ribosome moves, the amino acid in the first area binds to the amino acid in the second area, and the entire ribosome moves, allowing the first transfer RNA to leave, and the second transfer RNA moves to the first site, or for, to the um, P site. So translation has three different steps. The first step is initiation, where um, the... Um, ribosome comes together um, at a region called the start codon. The start codon for every single protein is known as um, AUG and it codes for methionine. And then we have um, elongation where the ribosome moves along the messenger RNA and allows new nuclear or new, new transfer RNAs to move in with their proper amino acids. And then we have elongation. Elongation, or I'm sorry, that's what I just talked about. And then we have the termination sequence. The termination sequence um, uh, is a stop codon, so it's a three letter code that doesn't code for an amino acid. As soon as, as the ribosome hits that stop codon, the ribosome disassembles the amino acids that bonded together forming a polypeptide are able to fold up into a functional protein. The transfer RNAs are able to go back to their RNA pool and pick up new amino acids. And Depending on the um, protein that was produced, we may start to translate the protein again if we need more of that protein dependent. So here we're at, um, here we see the initiation step where um, we have the AUG in the DNA or in the messenger RNA, and we have the um, transfer RNA with a UAC that will bind, carrying the methionine. We have another sequence right here. So here's the P site, here's the A site, and there's the E site. Another nucleotide will move into the A site, or another transfer RNA will move into the A site carrying with it um, the anticodon that will bind and the proper amino acid that is coded for. So CAG, or I'm sorry, GAC codes for aspergine and we have CUG that will bind. Hold on a second. Um, so once we have our long polypeptide and we hit a sequence that doesn't code for an amino acid, like UGA, that's a stop code, um, immediately the ribosome comes apart, the transfer RNAs can go back to their RNA pool and pick up new amino acids, or I should say amino acid pool, and then the polypeptide that was formed will be able to fold together producing the proper protein.
that it's supposed to produce. Chain elongation begins with the binding of a tRNA, which recognizes the next chromosome in the air pathway to the A cell of the ribosome. This is catalyzed by the TFCG transcription factor and requires a hydrolysis of the DNA. Once the tRNA binds to the base and the ribosome, the iron complexion is broken from the tRNA to the B cell. Process is promoted by elongation factor G and requires another GTP. This places the empty tRNA molecule in the B site of the ribosome and moves the tRNA containing the growing polypeptide chain in the B site. The next codon in the mRNA chain is placed in the A site. The uncharged or empty tRNA in the B site then leaves the ribosome and is cycled through elongation. Subsequent cycles of chain elongation, the polypeptide chain continues to elongate one other cell at a time. Chain elongation begins with the binding of a tRNA, so which recognizes the next codon in the mRNA to the A site of the ribosome. RNA molecule, this is catalyzed um, by the, the EFTU transcription and, factor and um, requires the, the hydrolysis sequence. of and a so GTP. Now, we have Once the tRNA the, binds in the A site of the ribosome, the polypeptide chain is moved from the tRNA the, in the P site um, to the amino acid to the, attached to the tRNA RNA in the A site. Allows Peptidyl transferase, a protein RNA complex present in the 50S their, ribosomal subunit, um, catalyzes proper, the formation of this new peptide acids. bond between the amino acids. The ribosome so then translocates to the next codon. Uh, this process is promoted by glycine. elongation factor Glycine's G and requires move, another uh, GTP. Will move to the this places the empty tRNA molecule in the E site of the ribosome the and moves the tRNA containing the growing polypeptide so chain the in the P site. The next codon in the mRNA chain is positioned in the A site. The uncharged then, or empty tRNA um, in the E site then leaves the ribosome and, and, and a cycle of chain elongation is completed. The, Through um, subsequent cycles of chain code. elongation, the polypeptide chain continues and to elongate one amino acid RNA at a time. To come apart, and the amino acid chain, polypeptide, to be able to fold into its functional form. And so here is translation again. Um, so the first process, transcription, occurs in the nucleus of the cell, uh, producing a messenger RNA molecule. Messenger RNA um, gets processed, removing the introns, adding a head, uh, a guanine head, and a poly A tail, a guanine cap, I guess. Um, and then the messenger RNA moves out, ribosomes can attach, and produce um, the proper protein associated with that. DNA, the DNA, makes protein, the DNA, 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 the DNA,
Break it down. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA makes protein. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA makes protein. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA makes protein. DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA makes protein. The nucleus dissolves when it's time to divide. Neutrogenous bases line up side by side. Sugar phosphate backbone goes along for the ride. String them all together, make a nucleotide. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. It works because the code's complementary. It lets you be you and me be me. From Coach Jim Tressel to President D. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA. Makes protein. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA. Makes protein. The DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA. Makes protein. DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, the DNA. Makes protein. Transcription takes the bases that are found in one gene, converts them into RNA. If you know what I mean. The bases pair up just like they did before, but you subs for T, which isn't needed anymore. RNA leaves the nucleus, but the job isn't done. Robosomes roll in to join in all the fun. Three bases make a uh, code and count them one. So now two, we're gonna get amino into acid for each code and the going protein. And um, this chapter, or this is a shorter chapter. Um, we kind of cut some of the material out. Because we just typically don't have enough time to go through everything. Um, and a lot of instructors don't really care for the time as much. It's a lot of um, dealing with microscopic structures, and a lot of people don't like it. But I love it. So we're going to talk about it. So when we talk about biotechnology, we're looking at the use of DNA is the star of this fanciful tale in the smallest mouse um, in the largest whale determining your features to until the last help us produce the cellular uh, obsession life on earth plants shall prevail. or animals the DNA, that have special the characteristics DNA, the DNA sometimes we might the be DNA, uh, the DNA, using biotechnology the DNA, to help us clone the DNA, certain the DNA, the DNA, the DNA, genes so that we can produce uh, medicine for patients or we might be using biotechnology to help us get a criminal. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for biotechnology. Um, cloning, in a nutshell, is the production of identical copies of an organism. Um, when you're cloning something, you're using asexual mechanisms of replication. So when we clone a gene, we're producing identical copies of a specific gene. Um, the gene I typically like to talk about is insulin. A lot of people know what insulin is. They've heard of it because of diabetes. And diabetes is a very common disease. Um, it's an autoimmune disease that causes, um, well, it basically, depending on the type, but if it's an autoimmune disease, then you have type 1 diabetes. And that one, um, you have the inability to produce insulin because your antibodies, your T cells, actually attack and damage the um, cells in your pancreas that produce the insulin. Um, and so we use gene cloning to produce lots of copies of a specific gene, such as insulin or growth hormone or whatever other gene we might need. Um, we can also use, um, or we can also figure out how a gene codes for a protein so we can figure out what the or what makes that protein what it is what amino acids are found within that protein and in what order we can um, use biotechnology and use gene cloning to alter the physical characteristics or the phenotypes of an organism so um, producing plants that have um, 
the ability to grow without a lot of soil or without a lot of um, sunlight or grow with um, minimal amounts of water. A lot of times we do, um, we take genes from one type of organism and we combine them with genes of another organism. This allows us to produce um, organisms that have new characteristics and it's also a way that we can um, help to replicate a specific gene that we care about. When we do this, a lot of times we use a vector called a plasmid. Um, plasmids are accessory rings of DNA that are not um, part of the bacteria's um, chromosome. Instead, they're extra chromosomal and they they give special characteristics to the bacterial cells. Um, when we use a plasmid, we're able to take the gene that we care about, insert it into the plasmid, and then have bacteria take in those plasmids. And now those bacteria have special characteristics, like the ability to um, break down oil in an oil spill, use the carbohydrates in the oil for um, energy. And that's one of the ways that we can clean up oil spills. And so here we see DNA, um, just it's regular, um, regular DNA um, that codes for certain proteins. And what we're going to do is we're going to have to cut the DNA at certain regions so that we can produce um, a hybrid a um, recombined copy of DNA with the uh, plasmid that we care about. So this brings us to recombinant DNA technology where we use um, special enzymes called restriction enzymes that cut DNA at specific sites um, and then we use uh, another enzyme called DNA ligase that um, seals DNA together. So we cut DNA, we cut the DNA that we care about, we cut a plasmid with the same restriction enzymes, which are scissors that cut DNA at a specific site. We then allow the DNA that we care about to hybridize with the plasmid, use DNA ligase to seal everything up, and we now have recombinant DNA. So here's a human cell um, that carries some type of genetic information. And here's a plasmid that is a vector. We cut a gene out of our human cell. Um, this is the gene for insulin um, using restriction enzymes. We also cut our plasmid using the same restriction enzymes. We allow the plasmid and the DNA from our gene to hybridize, producing this recombinant plasmid. And then we can insert this plasmid back into the bacterial cell and the plasmid will replicate on its own and the cell will also replicate. And so in very short period of time, we'll have millions of copies of that one gene. And then we can pull the insulin that is produced out, this is human insulin, and we can then um, provide human insulin to patients that have type 1 diabetes. One of the first genetic engineering experiments was conducted by Stanley Cohen and Herbert Boyer in 1973. They showed that the gene for frog ribosomal RNA could be transferred and expressed in bacterial cells. The first step was to construct the plasmid vector called PSC101. This constructed vector contained a single site for the restriction endonuclease ECOR1 and a gene for tetracycline resistance. The restriction endonuclease ECOR1 was used to cut the frog DNA into small fragments. 
Next, the frog DNA fragments were combined with the plasmid vector that had also been cut with EcoR1. The sticky ends of the DNA fragments aligned themselves and the segments were joined together using DNA ligase. Some plasmids incorporate genes other than the rRNA gene, and some do not incorporate new pieces of DNA. The plasmids were then transferred into a tetracycline-sensitive strain of Escherichia coli and plated onto a growth medium containing tetracycline. The cells that incorporated the plasmid carrying the tetracycline gene grow and form a colony of cells. Some of these colonies consist of cells that carry the frog ribosomal RNA gene. The researchers then tested the colonies that form after growth for the presence of frog ribosomal RNA. Another mechanism of DNA cloning is known as the polymerase chain reaction. And in this mechanism, we don't use cells, so we aren't worrying about bacterial cells at all. Instead, we're going to take DNA and we're going to amplify it in a test tube. For this to work, we have to have all the ingredients that um, replication or that, um, yeah, replication of DNA needs. So we're going to need nucleotides. We'll need um, DNA polymerase. We're going to need... Um, the RNA primers will need um, the special chemicals that allow everything to work. And we're going to use water baths to um, make everything run properly. Um, the three steps for polymerase chain reaction are denature, anneal, and extend. And each takes a different water bath. So this process. Uh, was found by a um, PhD in California named Dr. Kerry Mullis. And he figured this out. He was um, actually a surfing person, so he was out surfing. And it popped into his mind that he could grow DNA inside of a um, test tube instead of the cells. And this would make it more efficient, um, you don't have to worry about using restriction enzymes to cut everything and make sure that everything hybridizes properly and then insert everything into the cells and then pick the proper cells out. Um, with this, you just produce millions of copies of the DNA that you carry about. So here you have the first um, step so initially you have some gene that, that you know, carries that you have of DNA. Um, you go through multiple cycles and with each cycle, you're going to replicate your DNA producing um, or amplifying the amount of DNA. So if you start with two, then you have four, then you're going to have eight, 16, 32, um, and this will go on and on and on and on. Um, typically, we run about 30 cycles, and in the process, we're going to heat the DNA up to make the, um, the hydrogen bonds come apart, and that's called the denaturation step. That usually happens at about 92 degrees Celsius. We then cool the DNA or the water bath off to about 54 degrees Celsius. And this allows um, an RNA primer to produce uh, a, a, an RNA primer to be produced um, and attached to the three prime end of our DNA. Then we add DNA polymerase, and DNA polymerase will attach to the RNA primer, digest the primer, and produce a new strand of DNA, a complementary. Um, so once we add the DNA polymerase, we then move it to a warmer, hot, a warmer water bath, about 72 degrees Celsius, and that's the extension.
So we can use um, DNA cloning to actually identify individuals because within our DNA, I told you that a very small amount of our DNA codes for proteins. The rest codes for um, like promoter regions, um, stop regions, and there are regions of our DNA that we still don't know a lot about. We don't know what it does, but we do know that um, within different individuals, they can have um, different types of mutations. Um, one of these is called a short tandem repeat. And so when we look for these short, these regions in our DNA, we notice that different individuals have different numbers of short tandem repeats. And so one type of short tandem repeat is GATA. Um, you can have, you know, four or five short tandem repeats, or you might have eight or nine. Um, the number of repeats will determine um, the length of that chromosome. And so we can actually, if we look at, you know, every single person in our class, the likelihood that they have the exact same number of short tandem repeats in any given area is, you know, slim. If, 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 I, if I'm looking at two people, the chances that they have um, three short tandem repeats of GATA in the same place or in this at, at one section is going to be you know the chances of having a g at any given spot is one in four so you have to multiply the gata times the number of repeats um, to determine the likelihood of having that at that spot now if you add more short tandem repeats so what we usually do is we look at 13 different loci uh, um, in our DNA um, within our chromosomes and we look at the short tandem repeats and this allows us to identify each individual as a unique person. So it's called um, DNA fingerprinting and this is how we can um, or this is why we can be so confident that you know so and so is the father of a child or so and so is the criminal um hold on a second and so once we actually produce or we, once we um find those different repeats within our dna we can then run them on a gel. The gel is known as an electrophoretic gel, and we place that into an electrolyte solution and allow the DNA to move. Depending on the fragment size, the DNA will move um, faster or slower. Smaller fragments move faster along the gel because they can fit into the tiny little pores of the gel easier and this allows us to identify um, individual different individuals and so here we have um, mom's DNA here's a child's DNA and here's two males so as we run the DNA along we know this is mom's DNA here's the child's DNA oh I hate that sorry and here are two males DNA the child's going to have the same, um, a lot of the same characteristics as mom does, but the child will also have some characteristics of the dad. And so if you're looking at this, you can um, hopefully recognize that male number one is the father of that child. We use biotechnology to produce um, organisms that are called genetically modified. Um, if you've ever uh, purchased like glow-in-the-dark goldfish, those are genetically modified, so they're kind of pretty looking. Um, we 
we use biotechnology to produce transgenic plants and animals. Also, glow in the far dark um, is transgenic. Um, we also, you know, for bacteria that can break down carbohydrates, bacteria that um, can infect a plant and give it um, the ability to grow in very dry climate, stuff like that. Um, or plants that grow larger, taste sweeter, or, you know, whatever other characteristics we care about. Um, with transgenic bacteria, which are some of the most common transgenic organisms, um, we use them to a lot um, to produce um, different gene products that we need um, to help clean up um, messes that we make. So you know, sulfur, coal, um, oil, whatever. Um, and they really, it really helps us, or these organisms help us to keep our environment clean and. Uh, they're also able to help us produce different uh, proteins that sometimes cells can't produce anymore. Transgenic plants um, are the same. So we can take and insert genes into a plant embryo. And when that plant um, becomes mature, it might be able to be resistant to um, herbicides or it might um, produce certain proteins that um, our cells need um, or a pomato which is a potato and tomato put together so you're producing two plants in the area for one plant um, which would decrease the area of the field that you're planting um if you're looking at like proteins or antibiotics or you know any of those things um think of the lesser developed countries that don't have all the nutrients that we do if the only source of food you're getting is rice if we can engineer that rice to be more healthy to give you protein or you know vitamins that you won't be getting otherwise um, that's going to benefit you. And then transgenic animals, um, a lot of the transgenic animals that most people think of are the ones that are kind of cool looking like those glow in the dark animals. But we also use transgenic or we also insert genes to um, allow animals to grow larger or be healthier or be stronger, depending on what we're, what characteristics we care about. Um, and this allows us to produce those healthier, larger animals that can do more work or that can produce more milk or whatever that we care about. And so here we're looking at um, a goat I think that's a goat, right? Yes, that's a goat um, that we have injected um, or we've used um, a micro injection to give the egg the ability to produce insulin. And so as the egg, when the egg is um, inserted into a goat, a fertile goat, then the um, and it's fertilized and put into the goat, then the embryo grows, the new offspring, when it produces milk, can also produce um, whatever hormone we're looking at. So in this case, it's growth hormone. We could do the same with insulin. And so um, transgenic organisms are a futuristic thing. I mean, we're, we're seeing it now. We're not seeing it as often as, as some might like to see because there's a lot of um, 
bioethical things that we have to um, think about. Anytime you're modifying any organism, um, are you doing it for the right reason? I mean, you have to you have to decide. You know, is this really for the better good? Is the um, organism going to you know what are the future problems that could occur from producing this new organism? These are all things that we have to think about. So um, though we have transgenic organisms, we're still um, debating on if this is the right thing to do at times. So um, I do hope you enjoyed this chapter. I really like it. So you have a wonderful night and I will see you later. Bye.